Hey, welcome to Hacker Camp Shenzhen. I'm Ian from Dangerous Prototypes. It's also been done by Jen back there, who did all the legwork. He's also going to be our translator, and he arranges all the meals and does all the stuff that we've been doing the last few days. Zach's been involved. He's with Hackcelerator and some other things. And Akiba, who's responsible for the soldering school there from Freak Lab. Thank you all so much for coming. Let's see. Okay, so. We're going to try to keep this very light, right? We want you guys to have time to hang out in the markets, talk to each other. We don't want to give you really heavy presentations with dense information. We're just trying to give a little taste of something. And if you see something you like, talk to that person afterwards, find out more about it. Uh, we don't want it to be dense. We want it to be light and easy and fun. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Shenzhen. Jen's going to give you like a five, 10 minute Chinese lesson just so you kind of know what it's all about. We don't expect you to learn Chinese. Uh, your PCBs are back there if you submitted them. I hope everybody's got theirs and a goodie bag with stuff in it. Uh, for the Hackerspace Passport, we have a stamp, both for the market tour and the hacker camp. So be sure and get both stamps in your passport. Um, yeah. uh, the schedule's in flux. Uh, like Today we're supposed to have a sorcerer in, but she's coming tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we're supposed to have somebody talk uh, briefly about starting a business in Hong Kong and China and getting residency permits here. But that's been moved to Saturday, so we're juggling things around a little bit. Um, lunch today, group lunch, we've arranged at a Cantonese restaurant, just a five minute walk down there. And that'll be the starting point for the market tour. Uh, Akiba walked the route yesterday and kind of thinks we should spend about three hours doing it. Uh, along the way, we're gonna go, we're gonna take you to our favorite spots and the things we use most often, tell you about it. We hope to split people up into three groups of about 10 to 12. Uh, leading this many people through the market all at once is going to be a nightmare. So we're going to try to split it up a bit so you can actually hear the person talk who's leading you through the market. Uh, tonight, uh, 7 o'clock, we have hot pot dinner. That's a bit of a walk that way. Uh, anybody who went to the, Shinji, uh, the Szechuan restaurant last night, um, it's across the street from that. So we'll do a hot pot dinner. Uh, they're expecting us. It's my favorite restaurant in Shenzhen. I go there twice a week, easy. Um, and then after that, if anybody's still standing, we'll go to Coco Park, which is like a boardwalk bar street, or maybe just the barbecue to play dice and drink beer. Okay, so why the hell are we here? All right, so Akiva and Jen and I and some other people were standing out in front of a Family Mart convenience store, drinking tall boy Asahis out of straws, waiting for an underground fetish party in Tokyo to start. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, it would be cool if we could lead a bunch of people on a market tour all at one time. And Akiba's like, hey, you know, there's this awesome cell phone repair school that teaches you these advanced soldering techniques. I want to do it. So we kind of rolled it together and then this happened. When we originally planned it, we were thinking five people, Bunny, Akiba, myself, and two others who happened to be here for Maker Faire. I had no idea this was going to happen. So thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> When you hear about Shenzhen, people will talk about the districts. So I wanted to show you a map of that so you kind of know what people are talking about. Over here, this is Lohu. This is the oldest part of Shenzhen. It's Shenzhen 30 years ago was a little fishing village with like 300,000 people maybe, maybe less. And sometime around 1980, it went from 300,000 people to like uh, four, five, six, seven, eight million by the end of the 90s. And now it's like uh, 12 to 17, yes. depending on how you count the administrative districts. So this is a city bigger than New York. Uh, Fujian, we're kind of right here on the border between Lohu and Fujian. Um, the market is actually in Fujian. This is sort of Shenzhen's central business district. It's where the high rises are. You see the, the skyscrapers down there. Coco Park is there. Uh, it's the core business area. It's what you think of sort of as a downtown. Uh, coming this way is Nanshan. It becomes more residential. It's uh, high-rise buildings, but also, um, you know, they start to see workspaces. Uh, up in this area, this is where Seed Studio has their workshop and their factory. Um, down here, technically not its own district, it's Shirko. Uh, Shirko is the foreign neighborhood. If you go there, it feels like being in Des Moines, Iowa. There's big <laughs> four-lane boulevards through everything. You have Walmart, you have Western restaurants, and most of all, you have foreigners. Uh, you can go days without actually interacting with a Chinese person or speaking Chinese. I find it absolutely dreadful. 
Up here, this is the one you really need to know. You can forget all of these. This is Bao'an. This is where all the factories are. All of Shenzhen's heavy industry is up here. So if you go on a factory tour, it means getting in a bus, getting in a van, getting on the metro, riding an hour or two up in somewhere in a Bao'an to visit a factory. This is the industrial area, and it extends not just here, but clear up. You know, it's an area bigger than the rest of Shenzhen. You'll hear people talk about that, because they'll say, I went to a factory tour and I had to go all the way to Bao'an. So you know, it's this big area and it's super far away up north of the airport, clear up there. And this is Hong Kong. Hong Kong's our neighbor. You can see how close we are. Right here is the Lohu Crossing, uh, where the Kapi Mall is, where we went yesterday. It's, we're just neighbors with Hong Kong. We're separated by a small river that you can walk across the bridge and be in Hong Kong and get on the MTR and ride all the way into Central. This is our basic neighborhood. Most of you are staying in one of the hotels around here, the City Inn, the Mid-Century Hotel. Those are down here along Songling Lu. Uh, we're up here at number seven. This is our morning meeting space and will be for the next three days. Right across the street's the soldering school that's in that building over there. Um, here's the restaurant we're eating this afternoon. Uh, you've all got a map in your bag that has some points of interest, not just electronic stuff, but places to eat, places to shop, other cool things to go see. There's a couple points missing, uh, I believe 28, 29, 30, something like that. Uh, I accidentally cropped out the, the listing, but what they are is two KTV places and a food street. Uh, over here, this is where Hua Chong Bay is. So it's about a 10 minute walk. It's usually quicker just to walk down there than it is to take the metro. Along the way, you have used cell phone markets about here, cell phone component markets here, uh, more com cell phone components, and you go under the street, Seg Plaza is the big tall building that you can see down the street. That's a components building. This is where the metro comes out and this is more components. Number four is my favorite. It's what we call fourth floor tool building. We'll take you up there. On the fourth floor you find reflow ovens, BGA reballing equipment, uh, microscopes, hot plates, all that kind of stuff. Is that two play? Is number four? I don't know. Fourth floor tool building. Okay. You know the name. I don't know the name. <laughs> oh. So Jen is going to briefly talk about Chinese. So, you guys, so if you guys ready for some, some Mandarin? So um, in Chinese Mandarin, we have four tones. The first one, the flat tone. Most foreigners can do the first tone and the last tone because they're very easy and it's also in one of your tones. And uh, the second tone is a raised tone. So whenever I, when I teach people um, Chinese, I always go like, you wanna, uh, it's basically the second tone is about asking a question. So try to ra raise your voice like, hello, ni hao, things like that. Okay, the third one, people usually get confused between um, the second tone and the third tone. Um, the third tone basically you go, you go down and then you kind of like go up again. <laughs> Yeah, so the last tone, I always tell people, just go like straight ahead. Damn it, no, why? This is the uh, fourth tone. That's how you know how to pronounce the fourth tone. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry? An example. Ni hao, ni hao is the third tone. You basically go down ni hao. Ni is also a third tone word. Ni hao. Yes. Um, xia, X I A. Xia, A is a flat tone. Uh, it means shrimp. So, Xia. Yeah, Xia. It goes a bit longer than. It goes a bit longer than the second one. Xia. And then the second one. Uh, hui, hui, you can go up, hui, hui, hui jia, hui jia, you say this to taxi drivers, you'll be like, I want to go home, hui jia, hui, and jia, got it? <laughs> Falling tone, um, 我要, in Hua Cheng Bay, uh, this afternoon, we're going to do the market tour, so when you talk to the, um, talk to people, you go like, I, 我要, 要 means I want, 我 means I, uh, yao means want. So you go like, 我, 我要, 我要, and 这个, 这个 means this one. So basically you don't need to know much about Mandarin, but you'll get you around in Hua Chang Bay. Yeah, 这个 means this one. I want this one and that one. 
Okay? If you get the tones wrong, how hard is it for someone to understand you? Like, would they understand if you got the code wrong? Well, we're going to go to the next page. No, uh, later we're going to do the gesture thing. Yeah. So that will help you through the whole okay. market tour I'm just thing. Curious, like, if it's like completely like, I have no idea what you're talking about. If you get the tone wrong, some, like, some people will, some people won't. It depends on how much yeah. experience they have. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. I grew up in Shenzhen, uh, but when I talk to Chinese people sometimes, they, they do like repeat what I said, just want to make sure what I said. And they always do people, you know, people from different areas in China and they have all their dialects. So they all speak different kind of dialects of Mandarin. So when they don't understand you, it's absolutely normal because people don't understand me sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and the name of where we are now, that is Ke Xue Guan Science Museum. You, yeah, Ke Xue Guan. And this is Hua Chang Bay. Hua Chang Bay. Hua Chang Bay. Perfect. It's important to get it right because if you get lost, you hop in the taxi, you just yeah. say, yeah, everybody knows where Hua Chang Bay is, so, yeah. Next, this guy. <laughs> um, in Chinese, the formal way of saying like, uh, like American dollars, you say a uh, Chinese yuan. Yuan uh, is the formal way of saying uh, money, yuan. Yi yuan, liang yuan, san yuan, wu yuan, five kuai. So kuai kind of means bucks in English. Uh, people don't usually say yuan in Chinese. Yeah, so when you, because I know people uh, like study uh, Mandarin previously. So if you say like Yuan to people, they'd be like, uh, they don't understand. So just go for Kwai. So, Yi uh, Kwai, Liang Kwai, San Kwai, Si Kwai, Wu Kwai, Liu, Qi, Ba, Jiu Kwai, Shi Kwai. Okay, you do the gestures. And now we're going to do the real gestures. Uh, <laughs> so start with the first one. Uh, I'll lead you through uh, pronunciation, okay? So, again, E, e the first tone. E, e, e R, R, San, San, San Si, Wu, si, Liu, Liu, Qi, qi Ba, ba jiu, jiu, shi, shi. The gestures is very, very important here, especially if you want to make friends with Chinese people. And also, uh, some people came to the optional night, right? And we play dices. Yeah. And you know, it, it's a great way of knowing people, like if you want to be friends with Chinese people. And also, this is really, really important. If you're in the market and you want to tell people like how much you want this for and how many you want, and this is really useful because they either hand you the calculator or do the gesture. And if you understand this, they'll be like, wow, impressive. Probably a little bit, yeah, a discount, yeah. That's, that happens. <laughs> Ian gets, uh, gets around in Hua Chang Bay because of the gestures. People like him. And Zach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want to do this again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, let's do this. E. E. Hand, yeah. E, e R, R, San, Si, Wu, Liu, Qi, Ba, Jiu, Shi. Some people do ten, this, Shi, because in Chinese writing it's just like that, and you have two fingers. Shi, yeah, shi. Like yeah, a little cross, yeah. Shi. Shi. Um, either, either hand. Like, like a seven, seven yeah. Okay. And then eight is a Chinese writing, eight. So it's like that. Do you have to do either hands. Right hand? Hmm? Do I, either hand, yeah, it's fine, yeah. Okay. <coughs> And then we're going to do some simple phrases. And this is also very, very uh, useful in the market this afternoon as well. Um, hello, ni hao, everybody. Yeah, ni hao. And then, 
this one. Zhege. Uh, Zhege. So when you're out in the restaurant, if you, if you get a, a, a picture menu, and you can just point at the food and tell the waiters or waitress just say, Zhege. And it gets you everywhere. Yeah, it's really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> You don't need to say anything else, just like zhege, 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 and you didn't have food. <coughs> and naga, that one. Naga. Naga. Duoshao qian. Duoshao qian. Duoshao means how many. If you how duoshao qian means how much, right? If you want to say how many, you say duoshao ge. Duoshao ge. And too expensive. Tai Guela. <laughs> so when you're talking to the people in Hua Chambi, you have to use your emotion like Tai Guela. Then be like, give you a discount. Actually, in general, that's a useful phrase for, in, in, for Chinese people, anyways. Yeah. Tai <laughs> Guela. Too expensive, too much. Give a food massage to try to upsell you. Be like, Tai Guela. And they'd be like, oh, okay, fine, fine, come in. <laughs> yeah. And, um, Bu Yao. Raise and then fall. And how the how the uh sometimes you hear uh, the light tone, there's like no tone at all. It's it, yeah, it's just there. You don't you know about that. How the yeah. Thank you. Um both the falling tone. Yeah. Do you want to go through again, or you want? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, 你好. 你好. 这个. 这个. 多少钱? 多少钱? 太贵了. 太贵了。不要。不要。好的。好的。谢谢。谢谢。Very good. <laughs> advanced phrase. Ian put this up there. I was like, this is not advanced phrase, but, but it's really, really, really helpful. Um, when you're in the market, you say, do you have this one? Because in the market, sometimes they don't have whatever you want, but they can help you to find them. And they'll usually be gone for like 10 to 20 minutes, but they'll bring you the stuff. And say this, uh, 你 means you. 你有没有? Have. Have or not? 这个, this one. You have or not this one? <laughs> 你有没有这个? 有没有这个？有没有这个？有没有这个？有没有这个？The knees missing, sorry. Oh, actually, you don't need it. Yeah, 有没有这个? But to put it in context, when we go, when you go out to the markets, then normally, unless you can specify exactly what you want or they have exactly what you want, it's hard to say it. So nor what you would do is you would take a PCB. Or you would take a picture and you point and say, "You may have this one." So yeah, you have this then, one. So that's pretty much what you do at the markets. You just point, "Zika, you may have Zika." Yeah. Another tip for that as well is like you can look up the word on your phone. So if you want like photo transistor, <laughs> like if you want photo transistors, you can like type that in Google Translate or something, get it, and then be like, "Ni yo me yo Zika." Yeah. And read the okay the Chinese for photo transistor and. And the response to that is either yo or mayo. So the yo means have and mayo means not have. Hmm. 这个 is a magical word. You can use it anywhere, especially in market and restaurant. Uh, let's do this again. 有没有这个? 有没有这个? Okay. Next. Okay, uh, Ian's going to talk about uh, where to eat. Um, but then um, we... In your bags, there is there are two cards, right? And it's got the uh, 7-Eleven, the, uh, the address on. Uh, we usually, this is basically where uh, most of our events for the workshop start. So if you're lost, tell the taxi driver you want to go here. And on your back, on the back, there is um, all these different phrases that you may use in the market this afternoon. Just so, just point at people say like this, and they'll understand you. Uh, sit in. Sit in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
it can be difficult to get around in China, especially the first few times you're here, and it's very, very different. You have the option of eating at McDonald's, KFC, wherever, every day. You can do that. You can hide out in Western fast food, and it wouldn't be an un-Chinese thing to do. You know, it's not Westerners eating at the McDonald's downstairs. It's local people. But uh, there is really good food here. This is Shenzhen. There's people from all over China that come here to work. This is an industrial city. So we have food from all over China in a way that nowhere else in China does. So I'm going to show you some of my favorite things and kind of describe them so that you, if you spot them, if you spot them on the street, you know, oh, that might be good and you can try it out. Okay. First one is malatang. It's a hot numb soup. Right? It's from uh, northern China. What you do is you, you'll see shops with a, f a cool case like this, a refrigerator, and they're full of vegetables, meats, tofu, all sorts of things stuck on sticks. So you pick up a bowl and you pick up tongs, and you put what you want in your bowl, and you take it to the woman at the front, and she boils it for you, and then puts it in a bowl with some soup. Right? It's really good. If you're a foreigner, could you please? I'm sure it's somebody that's late. Thank you. If you're a foreigner, they won't make it very hot or very numb. But if you're a regular, and if you ask them for mala or doma, dola, then they'll give it to you very hot, very numb. That's how I like it. This is really cheap food. This can be anywhere from like 15 to 25 kwai, so under $5 for a big bowl of soup. It's great after bar food, and they have lots of vegetables, which you don't find everywhere, so you, it's a way to get lots of vegetables into yourself if you're sick of all the meat. There's one of these uh, next to the barbecue place. It's on the map, I believe, uh, down by the, the workshop hotels. This is one of my favorite, and the one down there is my favorite in Shenzhen. Uh, my advice is to look for one with two pots, one for boiling, one with soup. There are a lot that use one pot for boiling, and then they flavor the, the stuff and scoop in the boiling water. It sounds okay, like it's a broth that ages over time, but really it's full of starch from potatoes and taro and noodles and... It gets really yucky. I, I get diarrhea every time I eat at a one-pot Molotov. Yeah, can you explain what numbing spice is? Okay, uh, so the Chinese have a spice that's not really very Western. It's not known in the West. It's called ma, raising. Uh, it's, we call it Szechuan peppercorns or red peppercorns. It creates a numbing sensation on your tongue and your lips. So you combine the heat, which is the burning sensation, with the numbing. And it's, it's interesting. It's different than spicy food. It's a different sort of food. I, I really recommend it. I don't like eating the peppercorns. Some people actually like to bite the Szechuan peppercorns. They taste very citrus, a little bit numb. I, I don't really like that. They're kind of grainy. It's like biting into a black peppercorn, except numb instead of spicy. Hmm. The next is Suan La Fun, which means uh, sour, hot noodles. Um, you see these bowls all over the place. These two characters mean Chongqing. That's uh, both a big city, but also kind of an administrative region right, of China. Uh, it's in central China. They eat very, very hot food there. It's where a lot of Chinese hot food comes from. Uh, it's potato, sorry, sweet potato noodles in a spicy numb broth again. Uh, they put in coriander, ground meat, <coughs> peanuts, uh, some pickled something or the other. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, this is also one of my favorites. Uh, it's under 10 RMB, usually 7, 6 kwai, somewhere around there. Okay, all over you'll see buns and dumplings. So you'll see steam buns, which are very typical in the big baskets all up and down the street here. Those are usually one kwai each and have anything from mango cream filling to pork filling to beef to whatever. Uh, this is what I had for breakfast this morning. This is the place right across the street there. These are little dumplings folded up into a pouch with some pork and herbs and vegetables and stuff. These run four kwai for a takeaway thing with one of these trays. They'll usually put some peanut sauce on. Uh, I like to put on a bunch of black vinegar and then uh, some hot sauce. Okay, street barbecue. It used to be street barbecue everywhere in this neighborhood. All, every night after midnight, this city would set up and you could meet people who work in Hua Chong Bay play dice with them and, and eat street food, uh, eat barbecue. Uh, now it's kind of gone underground. The city council came and cleared all of that out. So now we have indoor barbecues, but you can still find, this is the back alley of where I live. She kind of hides behind the wall and, and makes barbecue. The nice thing about Chinese barbecue is if you don't speak Chinese, you can still eat it. 
because they'll have a big table with all sorts of things on sticks, meats, vegetables, tofu, again, whatever, and you put what you want in a basket, you give it to the barbecue person, and then they grill it up for you. It's also very, very cheap. And you know, if it's hot, if it's fresh, if it looks good, I'll eat it. I've never gotten sick from street food in Shenzhen, and I've essentially lived on it here. Just make sure you see it cooked. The meat, if the meat doesn't look great, don't eat it. It can be very low quality. Okay, tonight, this is what we're going to do. We're going to eat hot pot. So you have a bowl like this. There's hot coals in the middle. This is an official Beijing hot pot. Uh, so there's coals in the middle and soup around the outside. This one is half-half. So half is like a very mild soup. The other half is very, very hot, very spicy, very numb. And you, you take various ingredients like meat, tofu, vegetables. You dump them in the liquid and cook it, pull it out and eat it. So you cook one thing at a time. It's a communal dish. It's a communal soup thing, uh, usually served with lots and lots of beer. Uh, the good ones will have a sauce bar. Okay? These are all sorts of different sauces, sometimes 30 or more sauces, soy sauce, vinegars, chopped vegetables, herbs, that kind of stuff. You go and you mix it up into a bowl, you boil your meat, you boil your vegetables, and you dip it in your sauce. Two typical sauces, okay? The first one this is the classic, it's the soy mix. Some coriander, some green onions, some garlic, half soy sauce, half black vinegar, and then if you can take it, the numb oil. Usually there will be an oil at the bar, it's kind of nondescript, but it's got that ma flavor and it really like spices everything up. The other option is the peanut mix. You get peanut butter, sesame butter, ground peanuts, maybe a little garlic. Again, the numb oil really kicks it up. And also MSG. Don't be afraid of MSG. It really, really adds to the flavor of a numb peanut sauce. You're like, my peanut sauce sucks. Add some MSG, it'll kick it right into gear. It's like chicken. Yeah. So, um, this is the Cayenne we're going to. This is the one we're going to. It's just down here in the neighborhood. Uh, I go there two or three times a week. And I went there and begged them every time to let us have that place for the workshop. And they're like, no, they're really busy. They're really popular. It's probably the most popular hot pot I've seen in Shenzhen. And they're like, no, we don't need you. We don't want you. But eventually, we found the right owner. And she said, yes, we would love to have you. We'll get you in here, no problem. So we've got this set up for tonight, and we'll go down uh, there around 7. Um, this is, what's good about this is it has the coals in the middle. If you go to a mall, if you go to a big commercial hot pot place, they bring out just a pot of soup and put it on a burner. And you put in some meat, it kind of falls apart and swims all over in the soup. But with this like narrow edge around the heat, it keeps your meat, it keeps your food right in place so it doesn't kind of scatter and make a big mess. Cantonese food, okay? This is where we are, right? The food of Guangdong, the province we're in, is Cantonese food. And they're the people that originally speak Cantonese, right? But here in Shenzhen, we speak Mandarin because people come from the north and all over. Uh, it's not just Hong Kong food, and it's not just roasted grilled meats like back there, but it's all very mild food. It's vegetables, usually like with a slimy texture, you know, cooked up with cornstarch and stuff like that. It's also a lot of what Americans, I don't, I don't know, there's not a lot of Americans here, but in America is what we consider to be Chinese food. You know, it's generally sweet, meats, some vegetables, a sauce, it's that kind of food. Uh, you can identify these places by usually the meat hanging in the window. It'll be a Cantonese joint. Okay. There's some other options. Uh, Coco Park is the bar street. There's a couple Irish-ish pubs out there that serve a mix of Mexican, Italian, American, Western foods. They're really expensive and the food is terrible. <laughs> terrible. You want the worst cheeseburger in the world, go to Macaulay's and eat a cheeseburger. Uh, but you'll pay 16 bucks for it. Uh, Shirko, again, the Western neighborhood. They have a ton of Western bars. Dunkin Donuts. Yeah, they got Dunkin Donuts. <laughs> they got the works. It gets a little bit better out there. You can get acceptable pork ribs. Not amazing, but acceptable. If you've been in China and you're hankering for ribs, you can go to Shirko and get ribs. Um, some of us went to Japanese secret location over here in Lohu in the old part of town. There's a, yeah, there's a, there's a, a little Japan in basically one high-rise building. So there's actually, Zach took me there first, and we went to secret Japanese location on the 14th floor. 
But actually, there's one on like six different floors, and they all look exactly the same. <laughs> so I took some people back there, and I'm like, 14, where is it? I go to the 17th floor, but there's actually a much nicer one with a much better menu. <laughs> we also discovered one on 16 and below. And at the top, you have all, it's like a little Tokyo. You know, you've got KTVs, you've got hostess bars. It's like little Japan. It really is. Okay. I want to show you guys how to wash dishes. Okay. When you're at your restaurant, they'll usually have a plastic wrap set with a cup, a mug, a bowl, a spoon, and a plate. Some chopsticks. So you pull your chopsticks out of the wrapper, smack, you pop the plastic <laughs> open, unwrap everything. They'll also give you a discard bowl and a pot of tea or just a pot of hot water. This is what you do. Okay. Fill the cup with water. Okay. <laughs> Spoon on plate. We use the chopsticks. We're going to rinse the chopsticks both sides into the bowl. Chopsticks go on the plate, spoon in bowl, actually this hand, spoon in bowl, twist cup to clean the edges, cup aside, rinse your spoon, dump the water out over the spoon. Okay, now you don't wash the plate. The plate is for spitting on. You have bones, you have pieces you don't eat, you spit them on the plate. Plus, if you try to wash the plate, there's no good way to do it. You just look like a fool. Take it from me. <laughs> Okay, one cool thing you can do in China is open a bank account. It's fast, it's easy, and it's free. Uh, there's a bank of China, it's on your map. It's just uh, across from the conference hotel, across from the city end down there. Uh, there's usually somebody that speaks English. So when you walk into the bank, especially a bank of China, usually a manager will rush out and grab you and speak her, his or her best English. Uh, the one down here is a, a woman that manages it, and her English is very, very good. Uh, she's been there for a few years, and I, whenever I go there, there's never any problem talking to her. Um, she will get you, do you want an account, whatever. Worst case scenario, you put on your phone open account, or new account rather, because open account doesn't mean anything in Chinese. You say new account, and then you give them your passport, and they will fill in the form for you, tell you where to sign. Uh, Internet banking, for Bank of China at least, and maybe ICBC, is available in English online. They will give you the internet dongle, all the setup for internet banking, right there on the spot for free. Um, it's a 160 RMB deposit the last time I went uh, to start the account, and that's actually a deposit, it's not a fee, it goes into your account and you can take it out right away. They give you a debit card on the spot. Uh, this is actually my debit card. Uh, it doesn't have your name on it, uh, but it's got the number. And you can use it at anywhere they take union pay, which is just about everywhere in China. Um, this one's around the corner. Now, Americans, at least, if you have a foreign bank account, you have to file a tax form if you have a balance more than $10,000 in it at any given time. Uh, it's not a tax. There's no specific tax on it. But you have to declare it to the government on a form. And that's only if its balance is over 10000 at any given time. Okay, transport in Shenzhen. I hope you've all, yep, yep. Well, well, so if I have an account, how do I get money in there? People said you just pull out money here physically. Okay, good question. Yeah, okay. Well, moving money in and out of China is a pain. Um, what you think, oh, I got this bank account, I'll wire money to it, I'll buy stuff on Taobao. But it doesn't work that way. Uh, any wire you get, you're going to have to go to the bank in person, fill out a form explaining what the money is for, show ID, they'll copy your passport, and then you can receive the wire. At least that's what I've been told and the people who have done it have told me that's their experience. Uh, once you go more than 3,000 US dollars wired into a Chinese account, it gets really shady. Uh, they may not let you have it at all. I've had people told me that they've had wires rejected for being over the $3,000 limit. Um, yeah. Otherwise in person. You could go in person and deposit the money. Yep. Yep. So, just a couple of questions. Are there any safety rules you should be aware of when you're on the debit card? Do you have to get 
why, why do you need a debit card a Chinese debit card versus your external one? Yeah, well, I did it for fun. I just, <laughs> I thought I could do it. I wanted it. I wanted to have the card in my wallet with the Union Pay logo. Um, Security-wise, I don't know. It's a six-digit PIN. Uh, most Western cards are four usually. And when you pay with it, you both have to put your PIN in and you have to sign. It's like a credit card and a debit card at the same time. I, I don't know. I've never had any problem. The banks here seem pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. The the big reason for getting one of these is buying stuff on Taobao. Because it's really <laughs> tough to use a foreign card on Taobao and you can't use cash on Taobao. So um, this is like step yeah. number two or three to get a yeah. Taobao account. Right? True, true. But you have to stock it up one of these Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can pull out 6,000 RMB at any time from an ATM. So, like, um, Back in my MakerBot days, when we had an office out here and we didn't have everything set up, um, I mean, we were running the business off of go to the ATM, pull out from like four different cards. So you could pull out like three or four thousand a day, deposit in the account, and you know if you do that every day, you can you can transfer a lot of money yeah. into China that way. <laughs> that's that's what I do too. That's how I buy all of the stuff that we put into kits that we do up is ATM money over and over and over. There's, al there's also like from, from outside of China that when you get hooked up with the Bank of China stuff, you're going to get like a, uh, like a, I think a USB dongle which would have like some kind of verification key. And then you can, then you can theoretically wire money from your bank account wherever you are into the, the Chinese bank account. I don't think anyone's got that to work yet. Do you know anyone that? No, I don't know anybody. Uh, for the, for example, for the soldering workshop, we had to give them 28,000 RMB, is that right? 28,000 RMB was our tuition, and I wired it using XE.com. That's the site I use to wire money. It's like 22 bucks instead of 100 at my bank. I can do it all online instead of going in and signing. Uh, we wired them the money, and their bank refused it. So then we had to find another way to start getting the cash out of the ATM machines and stuff. I think, um, just so people know, from the UK, I think ICDC is setting up branches in, or something in the UK. I've seen them advertising for yep. all your renminbi needs. Um, yeah. When I lived in the Netherlands, we had a Bank of China in The Hague, and I tried to deposit money in The Hague in my Bank of China account, and it seems to be they're not actually connected. It was the same sort of corporate thing, and they have the brand name, but they said there was no way I could deposit money into my Chinese account through the Dutch branch. No. It may, may be different. You may get really lucky. <laughs> oh, you put your hotel address. They don't mail you anything. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's what most people do. And Chester is going to talk about uh, businesses. And Hong Kong is much easier going. It's no problem getting money into Hong Kong. Then you get into Hong Kong dollars and then use the ATM machine here maybe to withdraw it depending on what the fees are. You can get RMB from your Hong Kong account in Hong Kong, but the rates are really bad because they know what you're doing. You're trying to get money and move it into China that, that's not being controlled. So the rates are really bad and they charge a high fee for it. Um, that's one thing people do with companies. Lots of Chinese companies hold Hong Kong bank accounts because getting money in and out of China is actually quite difficult. RMB is a controlled currency. I'm not entirely sure what all of that means, but it means that wires are rejected, there's a lot of scrutiny on moving money in and out of the country, things like that. So when you pay a Chinese company, for example, a lot of time you'll end up wiring money to Hong Kong, and then they'll move their money in and out of Hong Kong too. But Chester will talk about that when he talks about the business side. Uh, it's, there's a popular thing to do, you open a chain, you open a Hong Kong company, so you have a Hong Kong bank account, that Hong Kong company then opens a Chinese company there's no limited liability companies for foreigners to invest in China. So if you fold in China, then it comes back onto the Hong Kong company, which is then limited liability. Also, you have the ability to move invoices back and forth somehow, which makes it easier to move currency between China and Hong Kong. It's very complicated. I don't really, I started to do it and then decided it wasn't worth it. The ATM was faster and easier. <laughs> Any other questions?
Uh, cool. When you buy stuff from Taobao, uh, do they ship it here or do you have to pick it up at the market? Um, they always, it's always by courier. Okay. Yeah, some things come the same day. A Aaron over there. Look at Aaron. He doesn't like to be popular. <laughs> <laughs> you can also do Alipay cards now. Yes. Well, we'll talk about, okay, I'll talk about that. So Aaron bought a bunch of stuff on Taobao. He had a Taobao day and had it all shipped to my office. Uh, some things came the same day. Many things came the next day. And things are still trickling still in from all over. <laughs> and so couriers, if something is in Shenzhen, a courier will literally get on the electric tricycle and bring it over to your address. Uh, but some things come from further away and take a few days. Shipping is really reasonable in China. Usually overnight is 12 kwai, 10 kwai. Really, really cheap. And you'll see, uh, if you're staying in the conference hotels, maybe you've seen the people sitting on the steps at night processing packages. You see in that? They'll have like piles of boxes and the little desks and they're writing on slips. That's the overnight back ending of all that kind of stuff. A lot of these apartments in this neighborhood are Taobao shops. When I was looking at offices, we actually went into a place that was an active Taobao shop. They had maybe 30 people in there sitting at desks, typing at computers, chatting with people, shipping stuff, families living in bunk beds in the side. It was amazing, amazing. Yeah? Um, I just want to point out something. I'm just looking at the um, Bank of China Canada website. Mm -hmm. They have prepaid cards that you can transfer in Canada into an onto that card and okay. use it at, in China. In cool, Florida. cool. Aaron mentioned Alipay. Alipay is the PayPal of China. Uh, you can use it on your phone to pay things. You can pay your taxi with it. They show you a QR code and you click on your phone and it pays Alipay. Uh, you use it on Taobao. You can pay on Taobao directly with a bank card. But Alipay is generally easier and faster. You link, um, okay, so to get money into Alipay, there's two ways. You link it to your bank card and you move it in. That's like PayPal, right? So they have your bank account, they have your credit card. You move money into PayPal. But there's two other ways. One, you can go to the 7-Eleven, like the one under City Inn, and they have a yellow machine there. You type in your phone number, you type in an amount that you want, you slide your card through, put it in your PIN, and it prints out a receipt and sends you an SMS with a code. Then you go into your Alipay, you enter that code, and it puts that money into your Alipay. This costs 1%. So for every 100 kwai, one kwai charge. Uh, what Aaron talks about are the cards. Uh, they now have a stored value card. You go to the store, you give them 100 kwai, they give you a 100 kwai card. Uh, the charge for that is 2%, so 2 kwai for every kwai. Yeah, so, yeah, you're, you're, you're well off having a bank card if you're going to attach it to an Alipay account. But uh, I have not successfully gotten an Alipay account yet. I, have I, you? I have the Alipay account, but it's really hard to, you have to have a, some sort of real name verification. Yes. And the form for that only accepts like the Chinese ID card yes. number and there's the passport thing just doesn't work. Yeah. So yeah. the one where you go to the, a, the ATM with the yellow machine, it's called the Kala. Yeah. And, uh, it, and you get the thing, it's such a fucking song and dance to get money in place <laughs> to buy stuff on Dava. The prepaid card sounds like the best way yeah. if you don't want to deal with the bank. I, I've heard that if you're interested in getting an Alipay account, you can choose the Hong Kong version and it will accept anything. But I've not had success with that either. It seems to shift a lot and a lot of the tutorials you see online are outdated and things change constantly. Yeah. Other bank stuff? Okay. Okay, hopefully everybody's ridden Shenzhen's awesome metro. It is the way to get around. Um, really cheap. From one end of, from Wohu at one end, all the way up to the airport in Baowan, it's like eight, nine kwai, and an hour ride or so. Uh, I understand that Shenzhen added 116 kilometers of new metro last year alone. And you can see in the middle of Huachong Bay, they're adding another line from south to north. It's gonna be done in a, a year or two, I think. Uh, so they're constantly building it. It covers this huge expanse of a city uh, as fast, as cheap, and easy to get around. Uh, what I like to do is take a subway to the nearest place where I am and then grab a taxi. Uh, taxis are really cheap here. Um, unlike anywhere else I've ever lived, I can afford to take a taxi just about anywhere. But if you get stuck going across the city, Lohu to Shirko or Shirko to Lohu, at the wrong time, you'll be stuck in traffic on the MIG road that goes right down there. Uh, so the subway is always faster. You get on the subway, you get to the closest stop to your destination, jump, jump in a taxi. Um, all the taxis here run on meters. It's, it's amazing. Taxi drivers are polite, efficient, and helpful. I have never been ripped off in a taxi. 
I've heard some bad stories about right near the crossings. If you come out at the copy mall especially, there'll be taxis waiting there who are like all a flat fee. But anywhere else in Shenzhen, I've never flagged down a taxi and had anybody do anything but turn the meter on without hesitation. It's not like Thailand, it's not like Malaysia, it's very, very honest and very, very up and up. Uh, the start charge, when you get in, they flag it 10 kwai during the day, 13 kwai at night. And sometimes your bill is three kwai more than you expect. That's because there's a three kwai fuel charge on gas taxis. So they're not ripping you off, it's like an extra charge and it's not on the meter, it's not on the receipt, but it says on a sticker on the dashboard. If you get the blue... Really embarrassing argument because of that, like when I first got here, I'm like, what do you mean? It says this. And the three, do three renminbi things, yeah. just, just add three to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the blue taxis are electric. They have no fuel charge. So you will see people rush out into traffic across the street to get that blue cab to save that three kwai. And sometimes taxis won't pick you up, especially at shift change, even though they don't have a sign in. They're not being rude. They don't dislike you. It's just that they're busy or they're going home or something. Sometimes foreigners will have a problem getting a taxi because they think you want to go to some far-fung place. Like if you're here in Hua Chong Bay, they think, oh God, he wants to go to Shirko. I'm at the end of my shift. I don't want to take this guy over to Shirko. I don't want to take him to the top of Nan Shan. Now, but if you, they roll down your window and you're like, Hua Chong Bay, Kushe Guan, then they don't really mind. They're like, oh, okay, you get in. Metro, uh, uh, single, ride, single ride thing, is that the way to go? I tried to buy one of these cards this morning, it was okay. not successful. Uh, okay, there's uh, two ways. You can go to the machine, and it has an English button. You can buy a single ride. You choose the station you want to go to. It'll tell you the price. You put the coins or a five note in. And then the other thing is, they don't sell them at the service window, but at the table, sitting there, you can get a Hello Kitty Metro card, or get the new one. Um, yeah, there's a little table there with Hello Kitty cards. This is the new one. This is a combined Shenzhen Tong octopus card. They sell this one too. You can use it in Hong Kong and Shenzhen. That is 100 with no credit. That one is 50 with 15 credit. 15 credits will get you seven or eight rides back and forth from Hua Chong Bay or anywhere in the area. So actually the card that Ian has, you can't, you can't get it at the the metro here, but you, I believe you can buy it at the service window at the metro. Uh, the table sells this one too. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, at Lohu they had it at least. Yeah. yeah. How do you know when it's about to like run out? Yeah, how do you reach out? Oh, okay, okay. Usually, there, there are machines where you stick your card in and put money in and it charges it. I have never seen them work. They always have a sign that says out of service or you touch them and they just don't do anything. Uh, so the way you usually find out if you're, you're low is you touch the car and it won't let you in. So then you go to the window, you put your card and some money down and smile and they add it to your card. <laughs> also, when, when you check through the gate coming out, it'll tell you how much it costs and how much is remaining. Uh, I, yeah. I think there's a minimum that you can put on the card. So like yeah. I tried uh, 10 RMB once and they're like, uh, yeah. yeah, I think like this for 50. So, okay. Um, yeah, just be aware if we're not accepting your money, they probably want 10 50. Yeah. A question about yep. taxis. I mean, so far my experience was actually just from the airport, and they did every single taxi try to rip me off right away. Really? Um, and I don't know, if, like I've noticed that the yellow, I forget which one, either the yellow or the green were uh, fine, and they used the meter. Mm -hmm. But the other kind, like I tried to take several, and they'd give me like ten times the price. Really? And I'd just have to get out. And, like, well, are they so I don't know. No, no, they were like officially at the taxi stand, like those yellow and green taxis, and every single one was trying to make me off. Really? No, I've never flown into the airport. I've never done that ride. I think they know you're a foreigner, whatever. Yeah. So, but yeah, so yeah. my experience was different. <laughs> but it's good to know that the normal ones here. Yeah. No, it's it's not. You know, I, I've been places like you go to Bangkok, try to get a taxi. It's it's a five minute negotiation to get the price, and then when they get there, they're like, oh, that was per person. You know, and that kind of stuff. I get that all the time in Thailand and Malaysia. And here, I go down the street, hand out, taxi stops, meter on. But again, I've never flown in and out of Shenzhen Airport. And I have uh, once come back from Guangzhou on the high-speed train. It arrives at midnight. And there's a queue for the taxi, like two or 300 people long. And the taxis are barely trickling in. I've walked around the back and found the guy smoking a cigarette, leaning on his car. Been like, here's 100 quiet. Can we just go? 
Uh, that's the closest I've come to that kind of situation. Good? Okay. So this is the extensive metro system. Uh, Lohu border, where it connects into Hong Kong. Also Fujian, it connects into the Hong Kong metro system too. Uh, this is the green line, this is where we are. We're here at Science Museum, Huachong Bay is one up. Out here, Coco Park, and I believe down here in Shirko at uh, this big boat that used to be in water, and then they put dirt all around it, and now it just sits there, called uh, SeaWorld is where the Maker Faire is going to be. <laughs> um, the hackerspace is here in OCT, which is sort of a really green, lush, sort of hipstery area. They have big lofts, they made big like loft apartment buildings and then put art things in them. I think those are old factory buildings that they converted into lofts. So like they're genuine. Yeah. Well, I always heard that they were like manufactured to be old buildings. I don't know, it's China. <laughs> <laughs> This isn't geographically anything like what it really is, right? Because it's actually the green straight, right? No, no, the green comes down and then goes up to the airport in Bauan. Right, okay, no, this is sort of, I mean, I walk from the high jump besides me here, that's straight. Anyway, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. Thank you. It's a cartographic liberty. Well, also, you'll notice if, you, if you've gone out the Huachong Road station, it's, it's a fair walk underground. So, you know, you can walk straight along the street and end up at Huachong Bay, but actually, if, when you get off in the metro, you end up walking clear, winding up back under the road and then pop up. That's vaguely correct. There's a little turn there. Probably not that big, but sort of. Yeah, this is a close-up of where we are. This is pretty much the area most people will cover. So Lohu, a lot of us went there yesterday. Um, Guamao, that's where Japanese secret location is. Up to Laochia, the old street where Dongmen is. Uh, Grand Theater, there's two giant malls there with luxury clothes and goods, and it's all very, very expensive and very fancy. Uh, Science Museum, where we are over here. Um, Huachong Road, of course. And Shopping Park, where it's the party area. There's a boardwalk with probably seven, eight bars, like proper bars. Uh, not just restaurants where you sit and drink. Uh, they play loud music, there's a club or two. It's uh, where a lot of Western people hang out, but it's not just a Western place like Shirko. There's a mostly Chinese people there, but also a heavy dose of foreigners. Just a note of warning about the bars, like be, on, be wary of pickpockets. Like every session with Accelerator, three or four people get their stone, bones stolen. Like it's really? like awkward, you can set your watch to it. Like, so just, you know, be mindful of your pockets. If a bunch of people crowd you, like, you know, put your hand over it or something. Mm. So. Excellent. Just, a, just an FYI. It's like probably the biggest crime. But, but typically in the city, it, that doesn't happen. I haven't ever heard of anyone just like on the streets. It's, it's mm. usually at bars when you're drunk, you're not paying mm. attention. There's a pretty girl that comes up and starts dancing with you, and all of a sudden you're like, we're not going to do that. God damn it. <laughs> I was, in, I was in China Telecom yesterday and there was a girl who was helping me speaking English and she was there for sort of phones and pick up and yeah. in the street. Yeah. But not enough, not far. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, crime is almost unheard of. I yeah, almost. For sure, like I'm, I, I lost my wallet on the way from the airport back and I got it back at the hotel. No cash in it. All my cards still there. It's probably common. But, um, you know, so you know, there's good honest people out there. They would take your cash. <laughs> uh, everybody wants to know how you bargain in the market and I tell people you don't bargain it's it's not worth it the stuff there is cheap really cheap it might not be as cheap as eBay or Taobao or a lot of online places but these are brick-and-mortar businesses that hire a person to sit there and they have rent but compared to what you have in your neighborhood it's cheap, right? And the thing is, the places here, they're set up for selling thousands. Minimum order quantity is usually a thousand of something. You know, they want to sell to manufacturers making big runs. They're not there to sell ones and twos to market tourists. So you kind of have to take the price you get. Once you go into thousands, then you might start, start see some movement. Uh, once you get to 10,000, 100,000, once you've ordered 100,000 10 times from them, then you start to develop a relationship and they'll give you good service and better prices. 
but stuff is already so cheap here. It's not worth pushing them down over one or two quai. It's not worth your time, it's not worth their time, and often they'll just ignore you and say, no, go, go away. Um, I say check prices before you go. You should know what stuff is gonna cost, and you can expect it to cost about that much. That way you don't have sticker shock when you get to the market, and you want your LCD, and you hope you can get an LCD for one quai, and they want 10 quai for it. Well, that's what it costs everywhere else, too, and that's just where it's at. Um, don't expect miracles. Uh, I, I don't have any problems with the prices that I pay here. I figure it's so cheap, it's cheaper than anywhere else, and I get it right now. I have it in my hands, I get to touch it, I get to check it out. Once we want more uh, big batches, we hit Taobao now, because you get to talk to somebody directly. They don't have the overhead of a market stand, which is thousands and thousands of quiet a month in rent. So you get things, usually half price on Taobao from what you see in the markets. Um, the important thing is to make friends and be really nice to people, and then they'll give you one or two samples for free, or they'll give you one or two samples for the thousands price. But you just gotta remember that this is a distri distribution area. They're here to sell thousands and thousands to manufacturers, not a couple things to tourists. It's just, it's not worth their time. Sorry, is it the same for instruments or one-off things like oscilloscopes? Yes, the price they give you for one, it's the price for one. They're not jacking around, they're not fooling you. Yeah, if you buy a thousand, you buy a thousand hot air reflow stations, you buy a thousand soldering irons, you buy a hundred, you know, reflow ovens, then you might get a little bit movement downwards. Okay. Um, the good benchmark is because uh, you can spend about 30 minutes kind of trying to haggle the price. Normally, you, can, you, you won't be able to move it more than like three or five dollars. So you have to say, like, you use your 30 minutes worth that much time. And really, yeah. what you really want to do, as you'll see today, is you pretty much want to get in and get out for all your transactions. Yeah. Otherwise, it just takes forever. Yeah. And especially if you're here on a short trip, it's not worth 30 minutes to haggle over 5 or $10, right? You might as well stay home and order things online if you're going to do that. So the plane tickets cover that. Okay, so everybody has a Hacker Camp Shenzhen calculator. This is the way to get around the market. And when I first started coming here, I noticed everybody had a calculator. You're like, look out, Chen. And they're like, type in the calculator, show you. All right? And Two can play at that game. Because you can't negotiate back and forth, you can't set a price, you can't tell quantity if you don't speak Chinese. So they'll type a number. You can type that into your calculator, and for US dollars, divide by six. That way you kind of know what it's actually going to cost. You're not using these funny red mouths. Uh, you can also type in how many you want. You know, how many do you want? Seven, eight, nine, ten. And you can offer a price back. You know, in some places, like the copy malls, for example. The prices are way inflated, and they'll offer you 600 RMB, and you know it's, it's less than 100 RMB, so you type on your calculator 100 RMB, show them. You have that advantage. You have the calculator in your own hand. You're not playing on their field anymore. That's why we gave everybody a calculator. You can try to bargain with it if that's your thing. You, know, you can try to get five bucks off that reflow oven. They may be in a good mood. They may like your face and your smile, and they may just give it to you at you know, that price. You know, but with the calculator, at least you can make the offer without saying the numbers. And you can tell them, I want one, I want two, I want a hundred, I want a thousand, whatever. So you can talk back and forth with the calculator, and that's why we gave everybody a calculator. I got around the markets like this for the first couple of months that I was here until I could do numbers quickly enough to spit things out and understand what people are saying when they speak quickly. The sorcerers are coming tomorrow. Okay, so after lunch, we're going to go on a market tour. I just want to say a few things about what you're going to see and how you should act. Okay. Our market route is something like this. We're going to come up here to the used cell phone markets. This is where they trade old used phones. I have no idea where they come from. Some of them come from a dump, probably. Uh, cell phone repair area, tool area back here. We've got some surprises for you. Uh, cell phone components all through here. Then we go under the road and come up. Fourth floor tool building, uh, component markets, International LED building, which is six floors of electronic stuff. Uh, seg market, then we'll come back. This is the surveillance area. They have surveillance cameras, CCDs on PCBs, stuff like that. Uh, then we'll walk up through here, and 12 is where Susie Shipper is. It's a whole alley full of people who do shipping. Listen for the tape. It's deafening. It just <laughs> They'll wrap anything up in tape and send it. 
A word about the shippers, because I'm not sure everybody at least the tour has all the info on the shippers. Uh, we use Susie Shipper. I found her when I was out here with Akiba and Bunny and a group of MIT kids. Uh, she'll ship with whatever method you want, and she can tell you the cheapest one to your home country. Uh, for me, I shipped 28 kilos to the Netherlands. Uh, it doesn't have to be one box, put it in all sorts of different box sizes, and the price was about $3 a kilo, so that was like 22 RMB per kilo. It's about three US dollars per kilo. Uh, for FedEx Air Freight, four days. Sorry? But you have to be above yeah. the threshold. Yeah. The rule is, at 20 kilos, you start to get the discount. So if you have 18 kilos, it'll cost twice as much as 20 kilos. That doesn't make any sense, but that's, that's how the rates work. So FedEx, I get FedEx Air Freight. Yeah, FedEx Air Freight, three to four days delivery. Any number of boxes, right? It doesn't have to be one box. It can be like five or six parcels. They send it as a shipment together. Uh, at 20 kilos, you get the steep discount. Until then, it just goes up and up and up. So if you're under a little, go buy something heavy. <laughs> right? I, I once went, they were digging up the road. I gave guy a 10 quai note for a rock and just tossed it in there. <laughs> Because it was worth it. Because it got me, it got me from 18 to 21 kilos, and the price went from like 150 dollars to like 75. It was worth it. Um, so we'll, I'll try to introduce you to Susie Shipper, who we use. She speaks English very well, uh, very honest. Their people do a lot of volume. They seem to be connected with all the major air freight companies. So you can get DHL, FedEx, uh, UPS. Then they do like custom air freighting on Emirates, Finnair. You know, all the airlines that do air freighting. Uh, uh, the, what do you mean about custom? You know, everything I've ever gotten from here, it, it shows up in my mailbox and it's like gifts. You know? yeah. Is everything a gift? Like, how does that, how does that I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe tomorrow, uh, Connie from Arc Robotics, she's going to talk about import export stuff. They've done a lot of that and they know more about it. Uh, what I know is that Susie Shipper will help me fill out the customs form in a way that makes it clear to the people that matter. Okay. <laughs> And uh, there is something, I, I don't know if it's really a thing, but it seems to be that you can set a scrap value for what you have. So you don't insure it. If it shows up broken, this is what it's worth. And that scrap value is very low. Now, whether that's really a thing, I don't know. But that's what Susie tells me, and so that's how we fill out the form. And, uh, you mentioned, I think, somewhere that Susie would do uh, town rail forwarding of, of a sort, where you could have her as she said she would do that for us, but I, as of yet, don't know anybody who's done it. The yeah. The yeah. How are you going to get the money into the... How are you going to get the money into the bank of China account to pay for the travel office? How about... <coughs> uh, yeah, I, I, those she's things aside, I understand, yeah. But she'll do the, she'll do the full I understand that, yes, yeah, she's offered to do that. I don't know if she's done it before. She's not done it for anybody that I know yet. And CIA or email or... QQ. And email. I think email too. QQ. Okay. So after Susie Shipper, we'll walk up here to Fish Building. It has a big fish tank in front. It's the dodgy cell phone market. So the first floor, you find those $10 cell phone sized, or sorry, credit card sized cell phones. As you go up and up, it gets smokier and dirtier. <laughs> and at the top, there's nothing but uh, little rooms with like four or five Chinese kids sitting there smoking cigarettes, drinking tea with one cell phone in a case. I have no idea what goes on up there. <laughs> no idea. And uh, across from that, there's a tablet market. I've not actually gone there. So the people coming with me, we maybe we can go check it out together and see what that's all about. But I think Akiba's been there. Uh, no, I go, I go to the tablet parts. Like, I'm probably going to go to the tablet parts place if people want to like, you know, okay. show the, where you can find parts to uh, rebuild broken tablets. Like, I, I'm currently bidding on 14 Nexus 7s on eBay for like, like 20 bucks a piece. And then they all have cracked cases. And then you buy the cases over down the street for like 10 bucks. And then you have them replace it. And they're fake, right? Huh? They're copies. The cases are copies, right? Uh, I don't know. They, they, fit, they fit Nexus glass. Like, uh, they're probably like, they probably disappear from. Because you get manufactured here, they probably just disappear somehow. <laughs> 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 when, oh yeah. Uh, you talking about camera protocol. Yeah, one minute, one minute. I got a slide. 
First of all, when you go to the market, there's going to be people standing around saying, Papiao, 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 Papiao. This is a Papiao. <laughs> it's a Chinese government tax receipt. And uh, you buy these as a business. It has your business number on it. And then, depending on how many you sell, the government taxes you on it. If you are a Chinese business, you need to turn these in for your expense reports. Or you give it to your employer so your employer knows how much you spent and they reimburse you for it. The people on the street are selling counterfeit Papiao's. So you give them one RMB, they give you a Fapial for five RMB. Then you go to your employer, you said, oh, I spent five RMB, they give you five RMB back. Or you give it to the government and say, you know, my business spent 100 RMB on products, when you really give the woman two or three RMB that's selling it, and it's, it's, a, it's a tax fraud, as I understand. The nice thing is, if you get a legit one at a restaurant, and at a legit restaurant you can ask for one, you have this scratch window, it's a lottery. You can win money by paying taxes. So you scratch it off. This one says shishya, which means thank you, but no, you, you didn't win anything. <laughs> I've never won, but I have heard of people winning up to 500 RMB for scratching their papiao. And then when you win it, if it's a low amount, it goes onto your phone. You dial a number, you type in the code, and the money's added to your phone account. If it's a big number, I guess you have to go somewhere and redeem it. So that, that's what they're doing when you hear all the people. And they sound... Have you ever seen the Chinese luck cat with the hands swinging back? I think if the luck cat made a sound, that would be the sound. At the beginning of the day, they're all very lively. If you're in Huachang Bay at 11 a.m., they're like, at the end of the day, it's uh, Stands have numbers. So you can pick up a business card from a person, and all, somewhere on it will be a number. And then you can hunt that stand down again based on the number on the business card. So you're not totally lost. And you can show it around and somebody can point you in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, are they XY? Uh, it, it, never, uh, never. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dumb, dumb, dumb question. No, yeah. they're not XY and they, some of them have letters and the letters are intermixed and it, numbering stops and starts and it's, yeah. yeah. Yep. Is there a strategy of sort of keeping a track of business cards? Because last time I was here, I had a stack of business cards and I had no idea. Yes, well, I would recommend if you buy components, put the card in the bag yeah. with the components. Yeah. That way, like when you grab the thing out, you're like, oh, where did I get this? And you have the card and all that info right there. Right. Otherwise, carry around the pen and write like what you bought on the business card. Yeah. But what I wanted to buy is. <laughs> <and, laughs> Take a picture of the car and yeah, yeah. Is, there anybody, is there any maps for uh, English speakers of the buildings with the names that they used for the building? There is a Huachang Bay, <clears throat> a Huachang Bay system, HQBS. Aaron? Has, he, there, Hackcelor Hackcelerator has an online site. Hackcelerator has an online map with some resources. Uh, Seed Studio makes the map that you have in there that's more of a kind of a humanistic map, I would call it. Uh, Aaron has a system with a photograph of the fire map of every floor of almost every building and notes with what's in there and pictures of it too. I gave him my thoughts on my favorite places and where I go as well. So you can check out the Huachang Bay system. It's, I believe on the Hacker Camp Shenzhen website there's a link somewhere to that. It's, it's the best one I've seen. We there? Okay. Finally, market etiquette. This is a big market and people work there. It's not just SEG building. There's like dozens of buildings out there with many floors of electronics and components. Stuff happens there. There's people running back and forth with piles of chips and boxes of reels and big carts they're pushing through the market. Stuff is going on. People work there. And we're a big group of tourists. Try to stay to the side, try to stay out of people's way. Try not to clog the aisle so that people can still get through. If we're causing a problem, they might ask us to leave. You know. Please don't take pictures on the, on the tour. Uh, if you want to take photos on your own, you can try it. People get kicked out of the buildings all the time. I worked with a documentary crew that was here doing something on e-waste. They got chased out of every building they tried to film in. Um, my friend Chris has a big DSLR. And he's like taking pictures of everything. He's been chased out of every building in Hua Chong Bay. Um, so please avoid photos on the tour. If you want to go back and take photos on your own, please feel free to try it. Uh, usually phone photos are way better than a big DSLR camera. Uh, one thing that's generally acceptable is when you're buying something and you're negotiating with someone or talking to someone, it's okay to take a picture of the part on the table with their business card, that kind of stuff. Nobody objects to that. 
But the security there, the guys with the red armbands, are really cagey about a bunch of foreigners hanging around taking pictures of what's going on. You know, there's counterfeit parts, there's bad parts, there's just people that don't want to be, you know, have their picture taken. Um, please smile. Uh, no matter what happens, please smile. That will get you a long way in China and especially Huachang Bay. And please bring your passport. Um, you're required to carry your passport at all times in China with your visa in it. Um, I have never, ever, ever been checked. I've seen Chinese people checked on corners all the time, but I have never been checked and I've never been asked to show it. However, there have been times when there were crackdowns and Hua Chong Bay had video screens up saying foreigners must carry their passport and they're doing regular checks. And my concern is just that this many foreigners in a group going around with a tour guide could get into some trouble. And if they ask us, we just show them, it's no big deal, they just want to make sure nothing bad's going on, show us who's in charge. I doubt it's going to happen. China's a very laid back place. I've never had any problems here. But just please, please have your passport so if it happens, the process is expedited. Uh, that's also why we're going to break up after lunch into groups of hopefully around 10 and different people will lead us sort of different routes so we're not a huge group going through the market. Uh, that's to be it. Thank you all. That's the end of the first day. Okay, now, as it's uh, just about noon and we have the restaurant reserved for noon. Cantonese food. Uh, Food's already been ordered, it should be ready for us when we get there. I imagine it's going to cost 50, 60 quai a person, so around $10. Uh, please pack up quickly and we will walk you over there now. Take everything, right? Yes, please take everything.